doctrines of the Bible. This is study number 108, and we're going to talk about the topic of discipline or correction. Discipline or correction. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing us to be in church this evening. Thank you, Lord, for each and every person. I pray you bless them for their faithfulness. Holy Spirit of God, please give me your power. I pray for the mind of Christ. I pray, Lord, that I preach and teach this Bible study exactly like you want it taught. And then, Lord, for those that are here and those who are watching online, please give us all ears to hear, a heart to receive, and a mind to comprehend. And Father, if there's anybody here that needs to be saved or that needs to be baptized, please help them to make those important decisions tonight. And we'll give you all the glory now for what you'll do in Jesus' name. Amen. All righty. And uh, okie dokie. So we're going to talk about discipline and correction. So before I teach you this lesson, in lesson number 61, I think is what it was, about 47 lessons ago, we taught a whole lesson on the, or a whole study on the chastening of God. Now, in this Bible study, we're going to include a few of those points. So we're going to remind you what, what those points are all about. But the overwhelming majority of this particular study is going to be new or let's just say different from the lesson that we taught on the chastisement of the Lord. So let's get right into it. Fill in the blanks as we go. And uh, let's, let's go with point number one. Words in scripture that are about this subject, there's many of them, so let's go over them real quick. Discipline is recorded in one verse. Correction is recorded in or found in 12 verses. Correcteth in two verses. Corrected in two verses. Correct in seven verses. Chastise is in 10 verses, chastiseth, one verse, chastisement, five verses, chastised is in five verses, chasten is in six verses, um, chastened, or, or, or chastened <laughs> is in eight verses, uh, chastening is in six verses, chasteneth is in four verses, and finally, chastenest is in one verse so you can see all these different verses in the bible that talk about the subject of discipline or correction there's a lot of verses all throughout scripture that that contain these verses and these words okay now let's get into some definitions number two definitions the first definition we're going to give you is the word discipline Here's actually what discipline is all about. Number one, education, instruction. Why do people get disciplined? It's in order to educate and to instruct. Cultivation and improvement, comprehending instruction in arts, sciences, correct sentiments, morals, manners, and due subordination to authority. The second definition of the word discipline tonight is simply the word correction, chastisement, punishment, intended to correct crimes or errors as the discipline of the strap, okay? So that's the definition of the word discipline. The second word we're gonna look at tonight is the word correction. The word correction has three definitions I'd like to share with you. Number one, the act of correcting, the act of bringing back from error or deviation to a just standard as to truth, restitude, justice, or propriety as the correction of opinions or manners. Number two, that which is intended to rectify or to cure faults, punishment, discipline, chastisement, that which corrects. Number three, in scriptural language, whatever tends to correct the moral conduct and bring back from error or sin, as afflictions okay so those are the three definitions of the word correction and then the third word that we're going to talk about tonight is the word chasten and again just please fill in the blanks as we go and uh, let's let's be sure and have our our minds focused tonight on 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 the bible study okay chasten three definitions number one to correct by punishment 
to punish, to inflict pain for the purpose of reclaiming an offender as to chasten a son with a rod. Number two, to afflict by other means. Number three, to purify from errors or faults. Okay, so as we think of the word discipline or correction, God's word has a lot to say about it. So I'm going to give you, I think, 18 points. I believe it is all together tonight. Yes, that's correct. Number three, let's get right with it. Number three, never despise the correction of the Lord. Never despise it. Um, in Job chapter five and verse 17, the Bible says, behold, happy is the man whom God correcteth. Therefore, despise not thou the chastening of the Almighty. All right, God loves us tonight, and when we get off base, when we get into error or into sin, God is going to correct us or chasten us to get back on the right path. And when that happens, we should be happy about it. You shouldn't sit there and say, oh man, God, why do you have to chasten me? Why do you have to correct me? Well, because he loves you and he wants to get you on the right path. He wants to take you away from error and away from a life of sin. And so the Psalm, or Job just simply said, behold, happy is the man whom God correcteth. If you allow God to correct you, you're going to be happier for it than if you just continue on your road of error or sin. Then Proverbs 3, verse 11. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. I had someone send me a text message just recently who said, who didn't, he, so he came to me for counseling and he needed help. So I gave him biblical advice. He didn't like it. He got, you know, he said, I didn't, you know, I appreciate that. You know, sent me a text. Man. I, fine, man, just <laughs> go on, be about your way. I mean, when, when people come to me and they need help, like especially when it comes to counseling, if I give you the help that you're asking for from this book, don't despise it. Don't despise it. You know, sometimes people um, have just different situations that, that they need help with, and, um, and they're off base, right? And so they come to church to find out that help, or they come to the pastor and get counseling. So whenever God gives you correction, when God instructs you to get you off the wrong path, don't despise it. You know, don't come to church and say, oh, you stepped on my toes again, preacher. No, the idea is if your toes are in the wrong place, move them. <laughs> Don't leave your toes in the place where they get stepped on, right? If God convicts you, that's a good thing. And never, 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 never despise the conviction of the Holy Spirit when he's trying to correct you. That's a good thing. Next, look at Hebrews 12, verse 5. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. So when God is chastening you, don't faint. Don't go, oh, is that all you do is correct me, God? Well, of course, that's not all he does. But when he does correct you, never despise it and don't get weary of it. Don't say, I'm not going to church anymore because all that happens is I get convicted every time I come to church. Well, chances are that's not true. You don't get convicted every time you come. But if God does convict you, don't despise it. Don't get weary of it. Want it because if God corrects you, it's for a good reason. And then you'll end up being happier if you allow him to correct you. Number four, I love this point. God corrects us because he loves us. Point number four, God corrects us because he loves us. In Proverbs 3, verse 12, the Bible says, for whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a father, the son in whom he delighteth. You know what God says? Not only do I love you, but I delight in you. And that's why I want to correct you when you're on the wrong path and get you back on the right path. Hebrews chapter 12, starting in verse 6. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son 
whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if he, ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure but he for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous but grievous nevertheless afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby verse 12 wherefore lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet lest that which is lame be turned out of the way but let it rather be healed all right so we know here that the bible says whom the lord loveth he chasteneth what is god's motivation for chastening us first of all he loves us secondly he says he does it for our profit when he chastens us it's for our benefit not because he just wants to inflict pain, but because he wants to help our lives to be better. And then Revelation 3, 9. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but, but do lie. Behold, I'll make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. God chastens us because he loves us. And then I, I think I put down the wrong reference there. Let's look at verse, uh, let me read to you Revelation Three, and I believe it's verse 19. I think that's the verse that I was supposed to read, even though that was a good one. And uh, let me put down here verse 19, if you want to add that into your notes. Um, it says in verse 19 of Revelation 3, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Now, God says, as many as I love, I rebuke them. I tell them when they're wrong. And then I chasten them. I correct them. I punish them to get them back on course. And here's what God says. If God is chastening you, be zealous about it and repent. You know what that means? The quicker you repent, the quicker the chastening ends. Amen? Some people, we get chastened by the Lord and we, we resist it. We're going to talk about that in a few minutes. So the chastening has to go on and on and on and on and on. Remember, what's the purpose of chastening? Is to get us from error and from sin and back on the right path. You know, if you're a parent tonight, and we're going to talk about this in great detail, you should correct your children. Not because you're angry at them, not because you want to inflict pain. You should correct them because you love them and you want to get them on the right path. And the quicker you teach your children obedience to correction, the better off their life is going to be. I mean, it really will. And we're God's children, right? So it's the same thing with us. He's our father. We're his child. The quicker we allow God to correct us, the better off our life is going to be. Number five, write this down. Now, this may not seem right, but it is right. Ready? Number five, we are blessed to have God correct us. We are blessed to have God correct us. I'm gonna read Psalm 94, verses eight through 15. Look what it says. Psalm 94, verse eight. Understand ye brutish among the people, and ye fools, when will ye be wise? He that planted the ear, shall he not hear? He that formed the eye, shall he not see? He that chastiseth the heathen, shall he not correct? He that teacheth man knowledge, shall, he not, shall not he know? The Lord knoweth the thoughts of man, that they are vanity. Blessed is the man whom the Lord chasteneth, O Lord, and teachest him out of thy law, that thou mayest give him rest from the days of adversity until the pit be digged for the wicked. For the Lord will not cast off his people, neither will he forsake his inheritance, but judgment shall return unto righteousness and all the upright in heart shall follow it. God says right there in verse number 12, blessed is the man whom thou chasteneth. You know what? God says if I chasten you, you're gonna be blessed because of it. It is a blessing 
to have God pay attention to us when we're on the wrong trail or on the wrong path. I was uh, talking to someone recently who said, I believe there's a God that created everything. He said, but I do not believe that God is interactive with us. And, and I just listened to him. I wasn't going to, you know, get in an argument with him or anything like that. But listen to this very carefully. How sad it would be if there is a God that created us and then doesn't have anything to do with us. That would just be sad. You know, I, I don't know about you, but if God is powerful enough to create the universe, I would like to have a relationship with him. And if he really is a God of love, I would like to feel his love, to be blessed by him. And not just for my own benefit, but so I can pass it on to others. So my whole family can be blessed. So I can be a blessing to strangers, you know, and things like that. But the fact of the matter is, it would be very sad if God just created everything and, and all of his wisdom, all of his power, all of his understanding, and then just sort of stood back and said, now y'all just get along. <laughs> Live your life the way you want. See how it turns out. I am so glad that God does not just create us and stand off away from us, but that he is interactive in our lives. I'm so glad. I'm going to tell you what right now. I am blessed. I am blessed when God corrects me. I really am. And I'm thankful that he does. And that's how you ought to feel. We are blessed to have God uh, correct us. Next, number six. Now, let's get to some practical, everyday uh, living uh, thought, thoughts. Okay, here we go. Number six, correction is grievous to those who don't want to obey. Correction is grievous to those who don't want to obey. Proverbs 15 and verse 10, correction is grievous unto him that forsaketh the way, and he that hateth reproof shall die. I wish I could tell you that everybody in this world that gets corrected, they receive it. It's just not the way it is. Every parent here knows that you've had at least one child who got angry at you when you corrected them. Usually it's when they become teenagers. Most of the time, children under the age of 13 or 12 they usually receive correction a lot better than teenagers do. But every parent here knows that there's been at least one of your children or at least one time in raising children when you've tried to correct them and they're like, grievous at it. That's never good. Never good. Why, why does anybody grieve correction? It's because they don't want to change. Don't tell me what to do. I can do what I want. I know what's best for me, not you. A lot of times, a lot of times in, um, in, in all authority and, and areas of authority in our lives, whether it be at work or in our family or at church, it happens here at church. I sometimes correct people at church, you know, because I'm the pastor. And I, do it, I try to do it in the best appropriate, polite, kind, courteous way. I mean, obviously, I, I wish some, sometimes with men... I can just be straightforward, just like a man to a man. Say, hey, man, stop doing this. Do this different next time or whatever. But a lot of times people get their feelings hurt. Why do they get their feelings hurt? Because they're grieved at correction. If your authority figure, whether it be your parent, your boss, your pastor, anybody that's in authority over you corrects you and you grieve at it, why? Well, the main reason why people grieve at it is because they don't want to stop doing what they're doing. They got pride. They don't want to be told that they're wrong. And, and they get offended. Listen, if you ever get offended at correction, then it's the problem is with your heart or with you, not with the person doing the correcting. Now, I'm not trying to excuse anybody that corrects in an inappropriate way. God will deal with them. And there's a whole bunch of people, in, you know, as far as authority figures, like, dictators or abusers, you know, parents or authority figures that abuse their followers. God's going to deal with all of them. But I'm just talking about, generally speaking, when you get corrected, do you bristle at it? Do you get your feelings hurt? Do you roll your eyes? I mean, I'm talking about adults now. 
I've had to deal with it for 29 years, different situations where I have to try to correct someone and they get offended at it. Well, the Bible says right there, it says, correction is grievous unto him that forsaketh the way. Don't tell me that I'm wrong. I'm gonna do what I wanna do. Stop saying that I'm wrong. You have no right. Listen, authority does have a right, especially God. But God-given authority, parents have a right to correct their children. Don't grieve when your parents correct you, kids. Don't, don't get like weird on them. They're doing it because they love you and they're trying to help you to live in the right way. So correction is grievous to those who don't want to obey. Number seven, listen to this statement foolishness is only driven away from a child by correction foolishness is only driven away from a child by correction proverbs 22 verse 15 this verse applies to every child in this room ready foolishness is bound in the heart of a child but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him okay parents Every child is born with foolishness in their heart. It doesn't matter what your child, I'm just telling you, don't, don't sit there and say, no, not my son, not my daughter. Yeah, every single child, all five of my boys, all of your children, every child on this planet has foolishness bound in their heart. The only hope of them to get their life on track and not to become a fool as an adult is for you as a parent to lovingly correct your children. We live in a weird society. Social services has a place in our society, but they've done a whole lot of harm, whole lot of harm. And, and again, it's not every individual social worker, but the idea behind social services that try to say it is wrong to discipline your child. I remember one time I was talking to someone in the social services system. They said, this is what they said in my presence, you should never spank your child. You should never put your child in their room and ground them. You should never, and they had all these things. Here's what she said. She said this to me. The only appropriate discipline for your child when they dis disobey is to sit them on the couch for a few minutes and let them think about what they did that was wrong and then let them get off the couch and then go about their day later. I mean, that was it. She, she actually said that the only appropriate form of discipline for a child is to sit them on the couch for just a few minutes and let them think about what they've done that's wrong. And then after the few minutes is gone, let them go. That is just a bunch of stinking hogwash and ridiculousness. God says foolishness is bound in the heart of a child and you have to correct them in a biblical, loving way if you do, it'll help them not to be a fool as an adult. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. By the way, you got to understand the Bible is for corporal punishment. The word rod there is a stick, a form of spanking on the bottom. That is fine. You know, I don't know about you, but I was spanked as a child and I turned out okay. All these people that try to cause, you know, they say spanking a child is so dramatic and so, oh, it's going to ruin their life. No, what's going to ruin their life is if they don't get corrected when they do wrong. Amen? All right, let's continue. Number eight, number eight ready? Parents should never withhold correction from their child. Parents should never withhold correction from their child. Proverbs 23, verses 13 and 14. Ready? Look, look at God's wording. Withhold not correction, are you listening? From the child, for if thou beatest him with the rod, now that word beat is not talking about, you know, abusing them. It's just talking about a repetitiveness against their bottom. That's what it's talking about. But let's continue. For if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Thou shalt beat him with the rod. Again, the word beat is talking about repetition of swings. It's not just like one tap. It's, it's just until you get the job done on the bottom, right? Thou shalt beat him with the rod and shall deliver his soul from hell. Listen this carefully. How many of you parents want your children to go to hell when they die? You shouldn't. 
How many of you want your children to go to heaven when they die? Well, I do. All five of my boys. So what's going to help them to get delivered from going to hell? You disciplining them when they're wrong, teaching them proper correction, so when they get old enough to understand that they're a sinner and God says you need to get saved so you don't go to hell, they'll say yes, sir, to God because you've taught them proper response or obedience when they're corrected. Literally, you know why some children don't get saved? Literally, when they get older, it's because their parents didn't teach them obedience. You see, the first thing to do, when, the first thing to know about when you, need to, when you need to get saved is that you're a sinner. The second thing is there's a punishment for sin, which is hell. If you don't teach your child, there's a punishment for disobedience when they get old enough to understand that they've sinned and the punishment for their sin is hell. If you don't teach them proper response like obedience, then they're just going to slough it off. Who cares? I don't believe in punishment. I'm, I'm living the way I want to live. If you care about your child, you will properly discipline them so that they can get saved and they'll spend eternity in heaven one day. That is huge, huge. Let's continue. I said number eight, parents should never withhold correction from their child. You're not a good parent or a loving parent if you never correct your children. You're not. Um, I heard one preacher say it this way. Parents, you're not your child's friend. You're their parent. So teach them how to live so that when they become an adult, they can live successfully as an adult. All right, next, let's continue. Uh, number nine, biblical discipline drives away evil. Biblical discipline drives away evil. Now watch this. Proverbs 20, verse 30. The blueness of a wound cleanseth away evil. So do stripes the inward parts of the belly. Now watch this carefully. Watch this carefully. Evil is different than sin. You understand? If you're not careful, your child's disobedience or sin can turn into evil. I have seen in 29 years of pastoring, I have seen children be evil. Now, what is the definition of evil? Basically, it is sin with the intent to hurt somebody. Evil could be murder, could be rape, it could be being a bully and beating someone up and being so mean to someone that, that you know, you do what a bully does. That's evil. Now, what is going to co correct that? When the Bible says the blueness of a wound, that is a firm discipline, a firm spanking, a firm correction. It will cleanse your child of evil. And by the way, when we as adults partake in evil and we're saved, God is going to firmly correct us. That's what is called about the blueness of a wound. That is a spanking on the bottom so firm that it leaves a blue mark, the blueness of a wound. Now, it's not that every time they do something wrong, you're supposed to administer that kind of discipline, but you are if they participate in evil. That's what God says. So when, when your child doesn't just sin, but progresses to evil, at that point, then you need to be a lot more firm in your discipline, and that will drive it away. Is everybody with me tonight? How many of you think God's smart? God's pretty smart, isn't he? If, if, if the government or contemporary thinking, our contemporary uh, political correct world disagrees with God, I'm going to tell you something. God's right. They're wrong. Proper discipline is what every child needs, every teenager needs. I'm so tired of seeing teenagers ruling the house at their home. You ought to be submissive to your parents. You ought to have a tender spirit towards your mom and your dad. And if they even hint at something that they want you to do or to change, you ought to be saying, yes, ma'am, yes, sir, 
I'd be happy to do that. I'd be happy to clean my room. I'd be happy to do the dishes. I'd be happy to wear the right clothing. I'd be happy to sit up straight in church and pay attention, mom, dad. I'm happy to do whatever it is that you want. If you can teach your children to have that kind of an attitude, then when they become adults, they'll be happy to obey their boss. They'll be happy to obey police officers in society. They'll be happy to do what is right and what is expected. And then guess what? They're going to have successful lives. Ready for this? How many of you parents want your children to become adults and go to jail? You shouldn't. Teach them proper obedience and proper discipline and it'll help them to stay out of trouble when they become adults you know sometimes we fail as parents in disciplining our children and then when they become adults they feel like they can disobey the law it's going to catch up with them you do the you do the dirty work while they're young and it's going to help them when they become adults to have a better life the dirty work is just disciplining. I have never woken up saying, you know, when my kids were small, I hope they do something wrong so I can spank them today. Now, they might have thought that I felt that way. They might have thought, oh, Dad, all you do is enjoy spanking, enjoy discipline and correcting us. No, I didn't enjoy it at all. It's called dirty work. But I did it with, the, with my heart and my biblical approach in a loving way so that they can become better adults. So every one of my children got saved when they were young. Every one of my children are adults now. They are functioning in society in somewhat of a successful way, you know. I'm, I'm glad that I was able to teach my son Joey correction. Now he's a police officer. And now he's out trying to administer the law, but he could never have done that. If I just simply let him be whatever he wanted to be as a child and let him do whatever he wanted to do and never corrected him and never did. You know, he had a, I think he told me at one time since he was in third grade, he's wanted to be a police officer. And if I just let him be a recluse and a rebel as a child, he probably would have never been able to achieve that dream of his. But teaching children obedience to authority is just greatly going to impact their life for the better. And you can help them. You know, can you imagine you, you never teach your child dis, uh, 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 obedience to authority and correction and all that. And then they go to work for someone and they have a boss that tries to correct them and they snap off at them. You know, they give them, a, give them lip. And then that boss fires them. Right? Because they never learned to be submissive to authority. And you could have taught them that all along as children. Okay, let's continue. Here we go. Number next. Number 10. There we go. Number 10. Here we go. Words are, words only are not enough for cor effective correction. Words only are not enough for effective correction. Proverbs 29, verse 19. A servant will not be corrected by words, for though he understand, he will not answer. You know what that tells me? When you're an authority figure and you have to correct somebody, don't just expect words to be enough. Again, I've had social workers talk to me, and they say, you know what? When your child disobeys, you just need to sit down, ready? Here's what they said, and have a talk with them like they're an adult. Listen to me. Children are not adults. They're not adults. You can't treat them like an adult. They need an adult parent to guide them. You can't just sit down with a four-year-old or five-year-old or six-year-old and just talk to him. Now, listen, uh, Junior or, or um, uh, my daughter, what would you say for a daughter? Missy? Here, Missy. What? Uh, Bridget? Okay, here, Bridget. Um, <laughs> you just can't do that. That's not right. Do you understand that it's taking your finger and sticking it in an electric, electrical socket is going to not be good for you can you just understand that you're talking to your three-year-old right don't stick your finger in the no he said what did you do when your child tried to stick their finger in electrical uh, socket i just let them do it laughed at them as they got electrocuted no i didn't do that i would i would slap their hand uh, especially like a like a one-year-old or two. Said, just slap around there no don't do that that's bad and then it'll hurt you and that gets their attention 
You sit down with a one or two or three year old and say, now son, let me give you all the reasons why sticking your finger in an electrical socket is not beneficial for you. First of all, there's an electrical current and it's gonna come through your finger to the rest of your body and it's gonna give you a sensation that's a lot like pain and it may even knock you out and you don't wanna do that. It may fry some brain cells in your brain and I can tell already as a one year old, you're gonna need all the brain cells you can get in life as an adult. So you don't wanna, you don't sit there and talk. You've got to have some form of discipline in order for it to sink in, all right? Words only are not enough for, for corrective, effective correction. Number 11, now watch this. Now, all of us should pay attention to this. Our own wickedness and sins can correct us. Our own wickedness and sins can correct us. Jeremiah 2, verses 17 through 19. Hast thou not procured this unto thyself, in that thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God when he led thee by the way? And now what hast thou to do in the way of Egypt to drink the waters of Sior? Or what hast thou to do in the way of Assyria to drink the waters of the river? Thine own wickedness shall correct thee, and thy backslidings shall reprove thee. Know therefore and see that it is an evil thing and bitter that thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God and that my fear is not in thee, saith the Lord God of hosts. Now, if you're smart now as an adult, your own wickedness, your own sin or backsliding will correct you. The best story to, to give you an illustration about this thought is the prodigal son. The prodigal son after he left the father, never went to church, never read the Bible. You know, basically we can derive from that. Got around with the wrong crowd, lived in sin, lost everything, wound up in the pig pen. And when he was in the pig pen, he came to his senses and said, wow, look at where I am. I am here because I left the father in rebellion. I need to pick myself up and go back home and ask my father to forgive me and just hire me as one of his employees. And that would be so much better than for what I have done in rebellion. So sometimes if you pay attention, your own wickedness, your own sin can be enough for you to self-correct. Sometimes you just need to look at yourself and say, is this what I want in life? How did I get here? Well, I did this, I did that, I did that. Wow, that sure didn't turn out like I thought it would. Maybe I should change. And that's called waking up or coming to yourself like the prodigal son did. Number 12, refusing correction will only make things worse. Refusing correction will only make things worse. Jeremiah chapter five, verses three and four. O Lord, art not thine eyes upon the truth? Thou hast stricken them, but they have not grieved. Thou hast consumed them, but they have refused to receive correction. They have made their faces harder than a rock. They have refused to return. Therefore, I said, surely these are poor. They are foolish. For they know not the way of the Lord, nor the judgment of their God. Why are they poor? Why are they foolish? Why do they not know the way of the judgment of their God? Because they refuse to receive correction. Proverbs 29, verse 1. Ready? He that, I'm almost done, by the way. We just got a few more minutes. Y'all doing well. He that being often reproved hardeneth his neck. Ready? Shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. You know what God says? If you want your life to be destroyed and you have no hope of, of changing it without remedy, just keep hardening your neck at God. Just, just do like that. I ain't gonna listen to you. When you harden your neck often, God corrects you and you don't receive it, eventually you're gonna be destroyed and eventually you'll get to a point where there's no remedy. There's no remedy. You don't want to harden your neck and refuse correction. Zephaniah chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Woe to her that is filthy and polluted to the oppressing city. She obeyed not the voice. She received not correction. She trusted not in the Lord. She drew not near to her God. You see, when God corrects you, don't do what this lady, this city did. 
She's filthy and polluted. Why? She didn't obey the voice of God. She didn't receive correction. She did not trust in God. And she didn't draw near to God. The worst thing you can do for yourself when God corrects you is to refuse it. Don't do that. Number 13, one should never want God to correct us in anger. One should never want God to correct us in anger. Jeremiah 10, verses 24 and 25, O Lord, correct me, but with judgment, not in thine anger, lest thou bring me to nothing. Pour out the fury upon the heathen that, that know thee not, and upon the families that call not on the, thy name. For they have eaten up Jacob and devoured him and consumed him and have made his habitation desolate. Psalm, 60, uh, Psalm 6, verse 1, O Lord, rebuke me not in thine anger, neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. You know what? When God first starts to correct you, he's not really angry. But if he has to correct you repeatedly and you, you don't listen, eventually he's going to get to a point of anger. You don't want God to get to that point. I'm just telling you. I mean, you just don't. Do you all know what the book of Revelation is about? Basically, the wrath of God. That's what it is. Now, you should never want God to get to that point in your life. Right when he starts to correct you mildly, just receive it. Just receive it. Number 14, scripture was given for us, to us for correction. Scripture was given to us for correction. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, Truly furnished unto all good works. This book right here, basic instructions before leaving earth. Part of this book is to correct us. I, I love what one preacher um, said this. It says, all scripture is given by inspiration and is profitable for doctrine. That's to tell us what is right. For reproof, to tell us what's wrong. For correction, to help us to get it right. And for instruction in righteousness, that's to help us keep it right. <laughs> That's what one preacher said one time. But God's word is given to us for correction. Number 15, number 15. The purpose of correction is to not offend anymore. The purpose of correction is to not offend anymore. Job 34, verse 31. Surely it is meet to be said unto God, I have borne chastisement. I will not offend anymore. You know what he's saying? Ready? God, you've corrected me. I won't do that again. That's basically the purpose, right? To get you to stop doing what's wrong. 1 Corinthians 11, 31 and 32. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord. Ready? That we should not be condemned with the world. God says, I correct you or chasten you so that you won't do that anymore. The purpose of correction is to not offend anymore. Number 16. Here we go. Parents, if you love your children, you will chasten them. If you love your children, you will chasten them. Proverbs 13, 24. He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth betimes. Proverbs 19, 18. Chasten thy son while there is hope, and let not thy soul spare for his crying. You know what God says, parents? If you truly loved your children, you would correct them when they need it. If you don't love your children, just let them do whatever they want. Don't even bother correcting them. Number 17. Two more points and we're done. Number 17. It is always right to turn to God in prayer when chastened. It is always right to turn to God in prayer when chastened. Isaiah 26, 16. Lord, in trouble have they visited thee. They poured out a prayer when thy chastening was upon them. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. Psalm 107, verses 11 through 15. Because they rebelled against the words of God and contemned the counsel of the Most High, therefore he brought down their heart with labor. They fell down and they, there was none to help. Then... They cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them 
out of their distresses. He brought them out of darkness and out of the shadow of death and break their bands in sunder. That means he took off the handcuffs. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Listen to me very carefully. When God corrects you, the right thing to do is to go to him in prayer. Ask him to forgive you. Ask him to help you to know what to do better. And he will be there for you every time that you come to him. Don't, just don't be proud and stubborn. Say, well, I've been corrected by God, so that's it. I'm not going to church anymore. Whatever. No. When God corrects you, pray to him and ask him for forgiveness and ask him for help. And he will be there to help you. Number 18 and last. 18 and last, here we go. Jesus bore our eternal chastisement for us on the cross. Jesus bore our eternal chastisement for us on the cross. Let's read the entire chapter, Isaiah 53. It's 12 verses. <sighs> Isaiah 53, starting in verse 1. Who hath believed our report and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of, out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded. Are you listening? But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He, brought, he, brought, he, he is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shears is dumb. So he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people. Was he stricken? And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he had none, he had done no, uh, no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Are you listening? It pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief when, he, when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great and he shall divide the spoil with the strong because he hath poured out his soul unto death and he was numbered with the transgressors and he bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Isaiah 53 is all prophecy about that. Jesus did that so you and I don't have to go to hell. Thank God for Jesus Christ. You may get punished in this life but you'll never have to go to hell if you're saved. If you're here tonight and you're not sure that you're saved, boy, this is the best night in the world to get saved because you never know how many more days you're going to have on this earth. If you're not saved, please get saved tonight. Jesus loves you so much. He bore your eternal chastisement so you could go to heaven one day. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you.